chat will be technologically smoother. Whether they'll be live or not, we'll see. Hopefully they will be. Uh, my name is Yoav Shoam, as you know by now, and uh, you've already met uh, Jackson. And let us first give you some a sense for what's happening in class in terms of numbers and statistics. So there are about 60,000 of you who signed into class. Um, about half of you have been active. So about 30,000 have been watching videos, uh, answering quizzes, uh, the problem sets, playing games, and so on. Um, um, the um, uh, the uh, the forums have been active. The, uh, for example, the uh, have the, um, have discussion groups uh, from over 30 countries. Uh, the total number of countries represented is obviously larger than that. Uh, we have people from Western Europe, from Mongolia, from Nepal, from China, from New Zealand. I don't believe we have Antarctica, but that's about the only continent not represented. Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Brazil. Yeah. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, we have some of you have uh, proactively volunteered to translate some of the captions, and we think that's great. As soon as so, there are over 20 languages that the captions are starting to translate. And as soon as the translation is ready, it's made available. Uh, on the uh, on the website. So this is great, uh, really a great service to the community, and we uh, we thank you for it. The discussion forums are, are active, as as you know. Please continue to be active. There's no way we will be able to field questions or issues from 60,000 people. We are now monitoring it actively, and we will chime in uh, when we can. But certainly continue to uh, support each other. And very importantly, vote up and down both the, co the questions and the answers so that the community as a whole and we can attend to the issues that are most burning. Um, as I said, uh, many thousands of you have played the games, and we'd like to give you some feedback, feedback on, 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 on how that's come along. And uh, do that? Sure, let's uh, hop into that. So we had a round of games that you've already played, and actually we'll show you uh, a graph from, from one of them. So we've had uh, more than 10,000 responses on various games, and we've been looking at some of the data, and uh, can you see, people should be able to see that one now. I think so. Can you see those graphs? So this is the histogram from the game, the Guess It game you played. So if you remember, the Guess It game was trying to guess two-thirds of the average guess. This actually, in, in terms of history, this was a game that was uh, discussed roughly by Keynes uh, in terms of trying to figure out what, you know, people trying to guess what the public is guessing. Um, so if you look at the histogram, the histogram is quite interesting. So it, it shows a number of things. Uh, the mode here, so the most frequent answer was 15. Hold on one second. Uh, one of you is not does not have their mic muted, and that is creating a problem because whenever you make any noise, the camera shifts to you, which is the blank image. So please, everybody, make sure that your mic uh, the mic is muted. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay. So if you if you have a peek at that graph, you'll see that the most common answer is 50 with a big spike there, almost uh, uh, just short of 1,800 answers, uh, which would just be sort of a, you know, a random guess in the middle of the, uh, of the distribution. Um, then you notice that there's a people thinking, well, if the average is roughly 50, two-thirds of that is 33. So you get a big spike at 33. Then people started thinking, okay, well, if I'm thinking 33, maybe other people are going to guess 33, maybe I should guess 22. And then you get a guess at 22. And then you get a, a bunch. And if you remember the reasoning from lecture, what's the Nash equilibrium? Well, everybody wants to be below the average. What does that mean? You're trying to guess lower than everybody else. You get pushed all the way down to 1. You see a big spike there at 1. So you see a, a, you know, a very interesting distribution. We're not seeing the Nash equilibrium play. Actually, the winning guess, uh, you have, I think you were pretty close. Uh, 
22-23, so it was actually, the, the mean was about 34, uh, the, the winning guess was between 22 and 23, so uh, people that sort of did two steps of reasoning uh, ended up doing pretty well in this game. Hey, not to uh, needle you or anything, but what did you guess? What did I guess? I, I was guessing uh, 17, actually, but that was... Uh, what? So what did we bet? What did I win? What did you win? I don't know. What do you like? <laughs> uh, well, I'd, I'd like a comment on my uh, on my Google Plus page saying, I, <laughs> Matt, hereby, say something nice. Yes, How about okay, that? Okay, okay. So All right. You have one. Um, right. So we, we uh, in terms of this game, I, w actually, now that you've seen the game, so this you know brings up one of these issues of what is Nash equilibrium and is it a good predictor of human behavior? So obviously, a lot of people played close to the equilibrium, but a lot of people didn't. But one thing we can do now is have you play this game again. So we'll put this game back up on the on the course lab, and then when you have a chance to go in, click again, play the same game. Guess now that you think everybody knows what happened in the, these data, think what you think people are going to guess. Try and guess, and and we'll see where that goes. Uh, so we can begin to see whether people get closer to a Nash equilibrium after a few plays. Um, and you know, as we uh, in in future installments, especially as technology uh, uh, cooperates, we will uh, share results from further games. Uh, they're often often quite uh, quite interesting. So um, maybe this is a good time to see if we can manage to get some questions from the audience. Perfect. And why don't we um, let's see if I can actually see the names of the people I can. And so uh, I will go. Actually, I only see two people that managed to get on for some reason. So let's go to those, and then we we've got on. A, well, we've invited those, but they have not joined. Okay. So, um, oh, well, there's some more joining. Yeah. People joining. So, whoever's been invited, please join, and we'll try to invite more. But why don't we start now? And Rebecca, if you can unmute your uh, button and try to ask a question, we'll try to answer it. And tell us where you're from. Rebecca, por favor. That's about as much Spanish as I have. All right. Uh, let's uh, while Rebecca is uh, recovering, uh, Miguel. Uh, we can actually see your picture. So hi there. Why don't you introduce yourself and get the discussion going? Yeah, I see you looking right and left. Hi there. <laughs> can you unmute your mic? Do you have a mic? Um, yes. It, does it work now? Okay. Right. Hold on a second. Okay. Keep going. Um, yeah. First of all, thanks a lot for um, having this uh, hangout with all of us, and uh, congratulations on making the, this course possible for all of us. I was uh, having quite some trouble understanding when uh, during the the quizzes when it's really a strict um, um, strategy and when it's uh, an Nash equilibrium. I was not really follow, uh, managing to understand even after seeing the results. So maybe you can just go through it quickly again. Yeah. You know, I guess uh, you know, the, the difference between dominance concepts and equilibrium concepts are that dominance concepts are ones that ask, can a person do well no matter what? the other players are doing. So you look at all possible profiles and strict dominance then is going to ask whether somebody's doing, you know, is there a strategy that regardless of what I believe about what other players I, I'm sure is going to do as well as any other strategy I can pick. So so the nice thing about dominance is you don't have to worry about what other people are doing. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, trying to forecast what other people are going to do. Whereas equilibrium is a very different type of concept. It's a, it's a concept about a point where if everybody gets there and everybody thinks that, forecasts that other people are paying very particular actions, then they're doing the best that they can. So, you know, some games have dominant strategies uh, and, and then they're much easier to solve because, you know, you, you can make forecasts of what people are going to do irrespective of other people. And in other games, we need to look at equilibrium points. And, and looking at equilibrium points then, 
are ones where you, you're, you're only looking at very specific actions by other people, not all the actions. And so it's a different, a very different type of, of way of looking at a game. Uh, and so dominance is wonderful when they exist. Often they don't. And then equilibrium is a prediction in, in cases where we don't have dominant strategies. I'm just smiling because I'm thinking about your wife needling you by email. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> uh, Miguel, uh, where are you from? Um, I'm originally from Spain, but I live in the Netherlands. Ah, nice. Okay, let's move on. Please mute your mic and let's see. Uh, Thanks for the question. Rebecca, are you uh, with us? If you are, we cannot hear you. So your mic is either muted or the gain is all the way down or something. Once more, Rebecca. Okay, let's move on. How about Gopi? Gopi Jayaram. Hello, this is Rebecca again, trying. Oh, great. Okay. Hey, Rebecca. So, Rebecca, we can hear you. Please, everybody else, mute your mic, and in a moment, we'll get back to you. Rebecca? Thank you. Hello, this is Rebecca again, trying. Hello, this is Rebecca again, trying. Rebecca, I think you're having a problem with echoes, am I right? Yes, I am. Can you hear my echo? Yeah, but can you ask a question, please? Yes, okay, I will. Right, uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is... Yes, I am. Can you hear my echo? Why are you can focusing... You echo? Sorry, what I'm going to do is I will turn off my sound so that yeah. you don't hear what I hear, okay? Okay. Good. Thank you. So, uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, why are Nash equilibria so important? Because I have seen games where one of the players can play a strategy that will yield him higher payoffs than if he plays uh, an equilibrium strategy. So, I understand that if one game is repeated several times, then the, the outcomes will probably tend to converge to an equilibrium, but why, if the game is going to, play, to be played only once, why is an finding an equilibrium important? So, a good question. Uh, uh, please, now turn off your mic and your speakers on so you can hear us. Um, and, shall I attempt? Sure. Give it a so, um, let me first acknowledge that there's a very deep question about what the role of natural equilibrium is, and I think we're going to have opportunities to return to this issue over and over again. So your question is a very good one. Um, I think you understand the basic reason why the notion of equilibria, in particular the national equilibrium, came up. It's because in a single agent case, we tend to speak about optimal strategy. What is the best thing to do? Uh, you may have an environment that's stochastic in nature and so on, and you don't know exactly what's best, but maybe an expectation you can find out what's the best thing for you to do. But when the environment consists of other agents who are reacting to you, uh, the notion of the optimal strategy is not well defined because it depends on what other people do. So when you say that you have seen situations where uh, there is something better for an agent to do than a Nash equilibrium, implicit in, your, in, your, in what you're saying is you're assuming that the other players will behave in a certain way, in particular not in an equilibrium strategy, in which case your best response indeed is not the equilibrium strategy. So that's very true. So let me drive this home. Let's take uh, one of the most basic games we know, which is rock, paper, scissors, right, or Rochambeau. Uh, and we all know, as we've discussed, there's a unique uh, Nash equilibrium, which is a mixed one to randomize equally between rock, papers, and scissors. Now it turns out that there, there are actually annual competitions of rock, paper, scissors, and you can find them online, and uh, it's very entertaining. And there are real cash prizes. As I recall, uh, there are about $10,000. Um, even in euros, that's, that's, that's meaningful. Um, and, um, and now I ask you, uh, so would you play the National Equilibrium? And the answer is, if you did, you would not win the competition. So your point is very well kind of uh, articulated that in real world situations, if people do not play equilibrium strategy, you shouldn't either, perhaps. 
but uh, it's a subtle point that we get back to it and maybe leave it at this. Do you want to add to this? I mean, Ed, you know, I, as we mentioned, I think possibly in one of the videos, uh, Nash mentioned this in his original dissertation, which was a, you know, equilibrium points are predictions that you can make, which uh, you need to mute. Sorry, could you please mute your microphone? Uh, please mute your microphone if you join. Thank you. Um, so, so Nash made the point that if you end up, uh, it, you know, having an equilibrium prediction, that's one that people wouldn't change if if they were there, but it's not clear that non-equilibrium predictions are good ones. So th there's a whole area of, this is one of the most studied questions in game theory and, and certainly something we'll come back to at many points as, as you have points out. And sometimes equilibrium are good predictions, sometimes they're not. And uh, th there's a lot to be said about this. So treat, treat a lot of the basic material that we're covering as a baseline that we need to understand to have a common vocabulary but it's just the beginning of the discussion of analyzing strategic situation, by no means the end of it. So Rebecca, thank you. Uh, I know you had more questions, but let's move on. And Gopi, we started you earlier on and then shut you up. Do you want to uh, jump in right now? Um, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you both for this excellent uh, opportunity. and. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a delight to be in your presence and uh, be able to attend your classes. Um, Where are you from? I, I, I'm right now in Chicago, right here, uh, on, the, on the Middle East, of uh, not uh, Chicago. <coughs> uh, having said that, I haven't had a chance to go through your material yet, um, and uh, well, I, I look forward to the class, but uh, the timing was off. Um, and, uh, <coughs> Uh, I have no questions for now. Okay. So thank you for joining, and please mute your mic. And uh, let's see, who else has not spoken yet? How about uh, Yad Winder, Garg? Are you still there, or have we just lost you? I think we just lost you. Um, is there anybody else there? Somebody there? I don't know. Okay. I think. Uh, who is this gentleman being hugged by a lovely person behind him? I cannot see your name. Anybody else wants to? Oh, this is Jim, Jim Chi. Hi, Jim. You want to say anything? Maybe not. All right. Actually, one, one question that came up in some of the emails we've been getting uh, is one about how one figures out which payoffs to put in a matrix. Do you we might say something about that. That would be an excellent thing to touch on. Yeah. What do you want to say about it? Um, so you know, there, there are some settings where it's really easy to figure these things out. So now there's a lot of uh, applications where people are looking at, at, say, auctions, where companies are bidding in auctions, and there's rev well-defined revenue streams that are coming out in the future, and people can really assign numbers to that. Um, otherwise, it can be quite difficult, and, and especially in social situations where it's not clear how one benefits or what, you know, do I care about other individuals in the game? Uh, you know, these, these are deep questions and it's, it's, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out, right? So if, if we don't fill in the matrices or the trees that we're talking about, well, we won't have good predictions. And so it's a, it's a really important aspect of, of doing game theory. The, and to, uh, completely, and to add to that, in general, modeling in any situation is a key aspect of things. Um, let me put two more spins on it. First of all, um, think about even about probability theory, uh, you, uh, which you know, has become an indispensable tool in reasoning about almost anything. Uh, we've always had the question of there, so where do the numbers come from? Uh, to some uh, in probability theory, the uh, frequentist, it comes from some historical data. For others, the subjectivist is really a mental construct that's really difficult to wrap your arms around, and there's methodology developed over decades to try to elicit probabilities from people. It's a deep question. When it comes to payoffs or utilities, we have even less of a handle. And one thing to remember, it's something we haven't uh, uh, spent a lot of time on, 
but utilities are not uh, monetary units. They're not dollars or yens or anything like that. They're abstract uh, payoffs, uh, and um, and um, in fact, uh, in utility theory, we know that if you can if you perturb the utilities by what's called a positive affine transformation. Um, that is, if you multiply all the utilities by uh, some co positive constant or add any constant to them, you really do not change the strategic uh, situation at all. So it means that our intuition about what those numbers are should be uh, rather, it's rather subtle. It's a very important issue, and uh, I'm glad that people yeah. raised it uh, in their emails. It's, it's actually a very active area of research, so there's a lot of people um, uh, looking, looking at these kinds of issues experimentally, and, and you know, brings in psychology. It brings in a whole series of issues. So our 20-minute uh, screen side chat has lasted now 50 <laughs> minutes. Yes. So we're sorry about the problems, but we're thank you for bearing with us. Uh, maybe it's good though to wrap up now. Uh, maybe remind yeah. people about uh, the problem sets and yeah. the lectures and the uh, quizzes. Do you want to do that? Sure. Okay. So, so just in terms of questions that people have had, uh, the you know the syllabus lists uh, due dates and so forth. So problem set one uh, is due this uh, suggested due date is April 1st, then we have the hard due date of, of uh, April 8th, um, and, and the problem sets are released along with the videos that, that should be watched with them. Again, the quizzes are there. Um, you can answer them as many times as you want. You can go back and forth. Problem sets you can go into. You can look and poke around. Once you hit the button submit, that's when the problem set counts. So the submit button is the key thing on a problem set. Um, just make sure you look at the syllabus. The, the due dates are there and listed. Uh, they should be rolling out frequently. So the next set of videos and the next problem set will be available as of Sunday at midnight, basically, uh, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, remember the, 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 the logic of things is when the lectures go up at the beginning of the week, at that time the problem set for the same material is made available, as well as the weekly review quiz that uh, that uh, that apply to the same material. So there's that kind of cadence that we uh, we will try to uh, stick to. Um, That's well, I don't know. So okay. So all in all, for a first uh, trial, could have been better. Could have been worse. Really, thank <laughs> you for your patience, and let's continue with uh, an experiment that I think fascinating to all of us. Yeah, so welcome, and thank you very much for all your participation. Bye bye. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.